Yeah, it's not just yeah. So like, what that was that? Yeah. Right. No, I I find it. Totally agree. You want me to monitor like questions? Yeah, same thing we did last time. Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. 
Hi, Susan. Hello. Hello, Mar Mario, Elizabeth, Jose, Omar, Cecilia, Kat, Christine, Annabelle. Hi, Annabelle. Willard, of course, Austin is on as well. And then I know Chris is just joining us as well, Chris Carino. And folks, we'll get started here in about three minutes, just uh, allowing everybody to come in so we can go ahead and admit them. And Chris, you can monitor chat and everything for me. Discussed. Yep, I got it. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Oh, perfect. Okay, sounds good. Yep, we can hear you, Austin. Thank you, Rob. I think you're on mute. Um, I think Chris I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Can everybody else hear me? Yeah, Alex, the best you can, can hear you. All right, I'm gonna put my stuff on max volume. All right, let me admit Curtis here. What's the bottle of wine in your background, Susan? <laughs> it must be a good one, knowing your tastes. Unmute myself. I was uh, doing something <laughs> else while I was uh, waiting for it to start. Uh, that bottle, uh, some French bottle, but it just reminds me of the wine cellar uh, stuff we do. Um, we do wine nice. cellar refrigeration. Uh, and HVAC. Nice. Well, my question is. That's a lot to drink at one time. <laughs> <laughs> is that a Magnum bottle? Uh, it's bigger. <laughs> yeah, the Magnum size. My question is, how come you're not sharing? <laughs> I'll share. <laughs> I have a three-door reach-in that I got from a grocery store that's sitting in our uh, shop filled with wine. Oh, that's my supply. I'm, over, I'm overdue for a visit to your location. Yeah, we, we <laughs> changed the temperature on it to be 55 for wine, for wine storage, and that's where I keep my wine. Nice. Okay, so I think we just submitted Deborah. Why don't we go ahead and get started? It's five after. So, first of all, everybody, thank you so much for attending. Happy Thursday. And I hope everyone's looking forward to the weekend and, you know, and, uh, and um, you guys all had a productive week. So this, as you all know, is part of our risk management training series that we put on. And uh, we just had one, I think it was about a couple of weeks ago on engine management training. So if you need a copy of that, of that presentation, I think it's a very effective one to ensure that, you know, all of our clients have the, um, have the know-how and the procedures to effectively manage injuries, effectively report the injuries, effectively work with your risk management consultants, as well as your, um, your HRCs in terms of ensuring that your injury management procedures are streamlined. So again, um, if you haven't, uh, uh, if you weren't able to participate in that training, 
we have a recording of it, or even better, even better is reach out to your risk management team, whether it's Chris, Austin, Joe, myself, and we can even do it personally for you at your office. And that is something that we do prefer because that is unique to your operations. So I'm always kind of, um, you know, pounding, pounding the drum, I'll beat the drum on that as to making sure, um, you know, you guys uh, have those procedures in place. Elizabeth, to your question is, yeah, reach out to your HRC or your RMC, your HR consultant or your risk management consultant, we can get the recording, okay? Or you can, we can get the recording to you. So speaking of risk managers, you do have your risk management team here. I think Joseph, Joe, are you on the call? He might be joining us soon here. But we have here the BBSI risk management team and Austin Smith is here with us and Chris Carino. Good on everyone. So both everyone. Austin and Chris will be helping me out with this presentation and also contributing to this very valuable presentation that we do today. So, you know, one of the things is if you don't know who your risk management professional is or your risk management consultant, please reach out to whoever your contact is at the business unit, whether it's, you know, Bob, Brian, Gary, Sharif, or whether it's one of your HR consultants. And each of you has an assigned risk management consultant. Our ultimate job is to support you in all your risk management efforts, is to help you with your injury management efforts, is to help you with your injury prevention efforts. If you ask us what our main, our main focus is, is to help you prevent injuries, as simple as that is to make sure that the most valuable asset in your organization, your employees, um, stay safe and health, stay safety, stays healthy and safe, right? And, and we also assist you by, by doing that. How we assist you is, is by ensuring that you have the best in class health and safety management programs in place, the systems. And, and look, you know, we're, we're, there, we're there for you 24 hours, seven days a week. And I know for a fact, you know, how, how amazing Chris and Austin are in terms of what they do. And of course, I support clients too. So if I'm your risk management consultant, reach out to me, all right? Uh, we, we meet with you personally, we do trainings for you, we, we write the programs for you. Everything that we're gonna be talking about in terms of the solutions today, we assist you with. So please take advantage of our services, okay? All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna get into the, uh, into the presentation here. Okay, can everybody see my slide? Yes. Okay, first thing you should see is some knuckleheads, <laughs> right? Can everybody see the knuckleheads? What's wrong with this picture, folks? Electric cords in the pool. Not enough things plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So why do I have this here? Well, the point of this is that safety, folks, is not always common sense, right? Safety is not something that, you know what, we just know all of a sudden when we, when we start a business and say, hey, you know what, let's go ahead and, and, and do what we do in terms of making the widgets. And, and all of a sudden, sometimes safety takes a back seat. And not, you know, it, it might not necessarily be you, as a manager, supervisor, or an owner, but it could be our supervisors, our employees, right? That are not really honed in on what has to be done from a safety standpoint. So safety is not common sense. As you see also over here, a lot of dumb things are happening on a daily basis where it puts our most valuable asset, our employees in harm's way. So it's almost, it's relative. What, what could be safe to someone else, right, may be unsafe, you know, to, to yourself. So everybody has their own perception of what a safe workplace is or how to work safely. So again, we want to make sure that we 
get away from this relativity, you know, position. We want safety right, to be very linear and very rigid in terms of what our approach is. And we, we want to ensure that we have solid safety procedures in place to ultimately prevent those injuries. Today, what we're going to talk about is the monetization of those injuries. You know, everybody wants to work safe. Everybody wants to have good safety programs. Everybody wants to keep away from OSHA. But sometimes, unfortunately, we don't understand what the cost of loss is, what the cost of those injuries are. And what happens, unfortunately, is sometimes Austin, Chris, Joe, or I, what we we'll have to do in order to get our point across, you know, for somebody to create, you know, a good health and safety management system or, or a best in class health and safety management program is to show them that cost of loss, the monetization or what safety ultimately costs you from a profitability standpoint. And that's what today is all about is to tie in safety with profitability, how it makes an effect on the dollars and cents. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the cost of safety. What people don't realize is yes, we have you know, the direct cost. We all know, right? What accident costs in terms of insurance, right? We understand that the more injuries we have, the more workers' comp premium we're having to pay. Let me share a story with you real quick, and this is real time. Is uh, you know we have a prospect that we're looking at. Um, it's a it's, it's basically this bike messenger company that they're not just bike messengers. What they actually do is they, they deliver food, right? So in, 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 in large city environments like Chicago, New York, and things like that, um, you know, somebody calls, they go on the website, and then within 15, 20 minutes, right, uh, they can get a snack delivered to them, sandwich or what have you, chips and things like that. You know, people that don't necessarily want to go out and have lunch or things like that. And then what these, what these people do is through scooters or their bikes, whatever, they, they, they deliver them food within 15, 20 minutes. So we're looking at them and um, these folks in the first year, they're just killing it, man. You know, they're, they're making so much money, but they're having so many injuries. You know, people are getting hit. There, there's, you know, uh, by, by cars. There, there, there wasn't a, a, a you know, a, a rider safety program in place. Uh, people even even at, even at the location where they're pulling they're pulling and picking, you know the the orders and things like that. They're moving. They're getting all these strains and sprains. So the workers' comp renewals coming up. And check this out. Their workers' comp premium on a month monthly basis went up sixty thousand dollars. Sixty thousand dollars. They're Pay, they were paying $20,000 a month, workers' comp, and I was having to pay like $80,000 a month in premium. So is that direct cost or hidden cost? If you look at the, right? If you look at the chart here, it's a direct cost, right? Because, because they didn't have a good safety program in place, they weren't controlling their injuries. Their frequency, meaning their the count of injuries, was so high. The other thing was their claims cost. Nobody was managing their injuries, and this is why we 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 stress so much on injury management because you have all these claims. Number one, um, the carrier, right, wasn't really looking at them. You have all these indemnity claims. Indemnity basically means lost time claims where the carrier had to pay for wage loss. And that's what indemnity is, right? Indemnity is a claim where it's not just medical, where the person's on full duty or mod duty, but where now you have lost wages. 
And I'm going to go into this a little bit here because this is really, really important in terms of defining cost of injuries. But remember, when you have an indemnity claim or a lost time claim, there should only be one reason why you ever have that indemnity cost here. Okay, associated with your claim. Or here, lost time. And that's because the, the injury was so severe where the doctor put them off work. Employee, they fall off the scooter, they broke their leg. Person can't work. Doctor says, you're too hurt, you can't work, you're gonna be off for 30 days. Okay, great, that's an indemnity claim or lost time claim, or another way to say it's temporary disability claim. Those temporary disability claims, what the carrier has to do, they have to put money now aside to account, you know, account for lost wages, right? So now the cost of that claim has increased. So instead of the carrier or you, in essence, having to just pay for medical treatment, you also have to pay for lost wages. So the claim cost now went up exponentially. And again, your premiums will also go up. So what you want to do is make sure, again, we'll talk a little bit about this later, that you don't have those lost time claims mm -hmm. by you know, having a good safety program in place, right? So you don't have these severe injuries, but at the same time, you're always accommodating. If the doctor has has you, has, a, has the injury on mod duty, you want to make sure that you're accommodating mod duty and you never ever get to a situation where you provide temporary disability benefits. So claim costs here are all part of direct costs as well as medical bills, legal, legal fees. Now let's talk about the hidden cost. Okay, or we call the indirect cost of the claim. What people don't realize is that once you have an injury, you have all these indirect costs that occur that when you talk to actuarials and other things and, and other people within our industries, risk managers and things like that, usually the indirect cost can be between 2.5 to about four times, four or five times the cost, the actual cost of that injury. Austin, Chris, is that kind of what you guys are also seeing in terms of what indirect costs, you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. What some of those other indirect costs are? I was, uh, I was going to jump in. I was just waiting for the right moment. And I think you're hitting on it is when you do have a variety of injuries, one thing you got to pay attention to that would be a hidden cost is when your X mod goes over the magic number of 1.25. So the more injuries you have, the frequency, the severity, what Rob was talking about lost time, it causes your X mod to go up. And when your XMOD goes over a specific number, you get labeled as a high hazard employer, which then puts you on OSHA's more, it's a list that they, they frequently monitor and you'll receive a letter in the mail. And that could put you at risk of, again, another hidden cost would be OSHA violations if you don't have the right plans and safety programs in place. Awesome, thank you so much for bringing about the high hazard list because I don't have that in my, in my slides, I'm so glad you brought that up. So really, really important. We're gonna talk about XMOD here in a second because that is a direct cost. Uh, and again, it, it, it truly ties into our presentation. But anytime you have a mod rate of 1.25 or more, uh, Cal OSHA specifically has a, a program, it's called a high hazard list. And I'll tell you how it works, is that what they do, they have a database of every employer, right, that has a mod rate of 1.25 or more. And then what, what happens is um, the enforcement division, uh, they give that list to the consultation division. And then you get a list, you get an email or you get a letter saying, hey, look, you're a high hazard employer. You've got two options. One is you do nothing, right? And you're gonna be considered high hazard. And at any moment we can do inspection on you. We can turn your entire operation upside down and we'll cite you all these other things. That's bad. Or two, Okay, you can have us come in as consultants, so-called consultants, and do the same thing. And then, you know, yes, we will we'll find all these things, but we won't find you necessarily. And believe me, you don't want OSHA calling you. You don't want OSHA even showing up at your door. Because as, as, they, as they term it, consultants, it's not really that way. They actually go in, they spend sometimes six, seven, eight hours at the facility. They do wall-to-wall -wall inspections. And then they give you this huge report of all these things that are wrong. And by the way, if you don't do them or if you don't fix them or they're imminent hazards, okay, they will actually go to enforcement and say, hey, 
You know what? I saw Austin Smith's company. Man, is he a mess. He's got people working on roofs with no fall protection. You should, hey, enforcement, you should go in there and start citing them. Right? So yep. that's why that moderate is really, really important. Then you get special love. <laughs> but the one thing about doing the consultation that is beneficial, though, it, it does take you off the, I, they take you off that list if you do do the consultation visit. Yeah. One thing I wanted to add, I wanted to add something to you to the indirect cost is the effect of the accident to your culture in the workplace, especially if it's something that's very serious or even fatal. Because when you think of those situations, you know, the employee morale kind of gets, takes a hit. Um, sometimes the workplace is never the same. So those types of injuries can really cost the, the whole culture of the company. Excellent point, Chris. Excellent point. Yeah, the, the morale, right? I love it. I love, I love you said that morale and yeah, exactly. uh, the culture. What are just from the from the from the team here? What are other indirect costs that you can think of? You know, besides some of the things we talked about. Mentioned everything that's pretty much on that on the last slide, which is like the cleanup time, people, the productivity is not going to be the same because no one wants to use a tool that someone was recently injured on. Um, yeah, it's just, you covered, uh, I think a good, um, majority of it. So. Cool. And, 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 and specifically, I was asking also the, the team, if anybody else has anything, go ahead and put, put in your chat or whatever, in terms of what indirect costs are. So again, keep in mind, in terms of indirect costs, it's usually between 2.5 to about four times of the actual direct cost that can, uh, that can really have an impact on you. Okay. Cause again, uh, lost time. Reduce wages. I mean, people, you're having to hire more people to replace that person, what have you, right? So there's a lot of other things that can affect you there. So let's talk about ways to measure, okay, the cost and the correlation between what we call standard injury KPIs and then the cost. So one of the things that you can determine to be, to to find out you know, what your injury experience is are a number of different KPIs we, we look at. So one of them you see here, experience modification rate. Austin touched a little bit on that. We're gonna go into that here in a little bit more detail. The other thing is your OSHA log, okay? What we call OSHA case rate. OSHA case rate is nothing it's simply, but it, all it is is simply how many injuries you have per 100 employees. So uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they have a huge chart um, and they basically almost literally break down every single industry there is in the United States. So whether you're a janitor company, uh, whether you're a manufacturing company, whether you're a trucking company, and they say, look, in your industry, you should be at this case rate. So for example, standard case rate is like 3.5 for, I think it's like the janitorial industry, facility services and things. So now if you have anything above a five or six, right, that means you're worse in terms of what your case rate is. So another way we look at this is we call it total case rate, TCR, or lost workday case rate, or basically incident rate, okay? And that is based on everything you have on your OSHA log. And that's why at the end of the year, some employees, some employers actually get uh, a survey sent to them saying, please submit to us your incident rates. It's also why, um, you know, if you, if you are part of our OSHA reporting or OSHA log reporting, Training presentation, okay. Uh, you have you have now requirements for some employers to electronically submit your OSHA data um, March second of every year for the previous year. So OSHA does monitor this stuff. And to Austin's point, if they start if they start seeing, okay, your DART rates or your, your your TCRs getting up there, it might actually even classify you as as a high hazard employer. Okay, and then there are other KPIs or metrics that you can look at, right? Look into your workers' comp claims, look into your loss runs, and, um, and out of the IOU loss runs, um, believe me. So we'll get that to you today. Um, number of regulatory inquiries, you know, how many OSHA citations? Believe it or not, every one of your companies, I can look up your OSHA citations right now. It'll take me 30 seconds. I just go into OSHA.gov and I see, you know, if it was, you know, Safeway, for example, I can literally look at and I can see how many citations Safeway got, you know, what the what the amount was, what the actual citation was. And keep in mind, especially if you're a contractor or GC, right? It's a vetting process. 
So if they see that you had a bunch of OSA cit citations, you might not get the job. So another way where we can monetize how safety and why safety is so important. If they see that you have a bunch of OSA citations or OSHA fines, you might not get the jobs you want. It's actually a vetting process too for companies like ISNet. There's third party companies where you're trying to get in, get a job. And what they do is they look at all these different things to determine if you're qualified to work. For example, Intel uses that. pg e uses that, right? It's a company called ISNet. And they use them to determine you know, how your safety program looks or how effective your safety program is. So if they see you have a high X mod, if they see you have a lot of citations, if they see that you know, all the programs that you're supposed to be submitting to them are not there, they might not approve you, right, for that company, whether it's Intel or PG&E that's that wants to that wants to bring you in. So again, another cost factor in terms of why safety is so important. Okay. Any questions so far? No. All right. So this is a um, an interesting slide. It was it was a study. Back in 2011, uh, by the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation, right, and this talks a little bit about, um, you know, ensuring that you have a best-in-class health and safety management system. Sharp is nothing but an OSHA program that that uh, that uh, is 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 designed to help you with uh, an overall health and safety management system. That is, by the way, something that we do as risk managers for you, right? You need to you need to uh, go into a Sharp program. Uh, to have these programs put in place. But after companies put in a solid health and safety management system, a program, right, they saw average number of claims decreased by 52%, the cost of claims by 80%, the average lost time per claim decreased 87%. Think about that. Remember the indemnity part of that I talked about, right? So all those severe claims, they dropped 87%. And then claims per million dollars of payroll, 88%. Again, these are true numbers, right? By installing a solid best in class health and safety management system. Another chart here, okay? Implementing a safety and health program. This goes into the direct cost. Okay, so it can help employees avoid direct cost, result from workplace incidents, lost time due to stoppages, investigations, training costs. Right, were replaced, lost or damaged to material and machinery. So again, as I mentioned here, the indirect costs can usually be between 2.5 to about four times here, so I'm pointing out here, of the actual direct cost. Oops. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides, and we're actually going to go do an exercise here. What does it mean to you from a revenue standpoint? Okay. So each of you knows pretty much what your profit margin is. Now, you might know, or your business, your business owner knows, whatever. Okay, but this diagram illustrates how much more you have to make in sales or revenue to pay for an accident. So let's just say your accident cost, okay, was 5,000, typical back injury, right? Might cost you about 5,000 bucks. And that's medical, folks, remember, medical. I'm talking about not indemnity, right? If you had a 1% profit margin, you have to make it up in sales by making up by by uh, by having five hundred thousand dollars in sales just to make up for that five thousand dollar injury. Pretty significant, right? All right. If you have two percent, two hundred fifty thousand. I'm going to show you something here. You guys can. All, we're going to send you all links to this too. But. OSHA has this great thing, it's called Safety Pens. It's a website that tells you what your true cost of an injury is. So, 
Help me out with these, some of these numbers. Any, this could be anybody. Let's talk. Somebody give me a number for an injury. Just let's just take one injury. Okay. Give me a number about how much you think that injury would cost. Fifteen thousand. Okay. So let's put in fifteen thousand. Okay. Somebody give me a profit margin number. Anybody? And or we, we don't have to do it. Let's just say two percent. Two percent. Okay. Now let's just take that one injury. I'm only going to keep it for that one injury, that fifteen thousand dollar injury. Okay. So I'm going to put in here extra number of claims. I'm going to put in one. All right. We're going to calculate this. You see it right here on the bottom. How much total do I have to do in sales to make up for that $15,000 injury? One point what? 1.5 million. Pretty significant, isn't it? Just for one $15,000 injury. So you had the direct cost of 15,000, indirect cost, and, and by the way, just so you know, this, this is using about a 1.1 ratio, right? OSHA in their website, the Safety Pays website, is very, very conservative, right? In terms of their calculation. So there, it's almost at a 1.1 times that 15,000. And then you got the total cost, right? Because you got the direct cost by the, plus the indirect cost, Total cost, additional sales for the indirect cost, and additional sales total. Does that help you understand why, why safety is so important and why we want to reduce accidents, right? It monetizes it right here. This is an actual OSHA website. It's called Safety Pays, and they want employers going in here all the time and filling in numbers so that they understand why having a health and safety management system is so important. Chris, Austin, anything to add? Anybody else to add on this? I think the, I think you summarize it pretty, pretty easily in regards to, you know, taking a, the cost of a claim and determining what the overall value is, so. Yeah, the numbers don't lie, pretty oh, much. Yeah. Chris, I love what you said. The numbers don't <laughs> lie, folks. The numbers don't lie. Okay. All right. So that's from a profitability standpoint, re revenue standpoint, injuries cost money, folks. Now let's talk about what Austin was talking about, which is X mod. Uh, you know, Austin, Chris, and I, we can do an entire one hour, two hour presentation on X mods. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. So, you know, excuse me if it's, if it's, too simplified, but XMOD is basically like a credit score for workers' compensation, okay? And, but it's different. So in, in the financial world, right, we want a higher credit score, right? We want to be in the 600s, 700s, whatever it is. In the world of workers' comp, we want XMOD lower, right? So the higher the XMOD, as Austin explained, Right, the more you are labeled as a high hazard employer, exactly as Austin said. So why is that? So as the slide shows, when you first start a company, let's just say, you know, you start that. Let's go back to that bike messenger company. Right? Hey, so I'm gonna I'm gonna create this great bike messenger company. Um, and then, you know, what you have to do is over time you actually have to build payroll enough payroll to qualify for mod. So not every company is going to have a mod rate published immediately because you have to build enough payroll to a given time. But once you have that given payroll to calculate X mod, right, you start off at one. And one is a, it's a ratio. That means you're just as good as every other bike messenger company out there. Right? Because you're starting off. You have no experience, lost experience. Okay, that's why they call it experience modification. So 
you know, you start building operation in time, you know, you have a good safety program, bad safety program, you, you get injuries here and there. What happens is your mod rate starts changing, or maybe it could stay at one. And let's just say in three years, your mod rate went from one, okay, to 1.2. What that in essence says here, right, is that you've now added 20% to your base premium of your workers' compensation costs. So real quick, let's just rewind here. How is workers' comp premiums calculated, right? You basically have every, every single job in the country has what we call a workers' comp class code. So for example, 54.3 near construction, all right? That's the carpentry for construction, right? So it says for carpentry, 54.3, um, you know, it might be $10 for every $100 in payroll that you're going to pay on your premium. Or, right, if it's 54 or 5432, which is more experienced employees, right? They're apprentice, I mean, they're the, uh, uh, the journeyman and things like that, it might be lower. So, depending on that, so if you had, you know, a payroll of $500,000, and then you were in that 5432 class, which is about $4.50, let's say here and there, right? If I do a calculation per $100 in payroll, that comes out to be about $22,500. So I, I did the math earlier, right? So now my, my, my base workers comp premium starts off at $22,500, right? In this case, $750,000, right? Because again, it's a derivative of the class code and how much that class code costs per $100 in payroll. So once I have that base premium, which here shows $750,000, now as a carrier, what they do, workers' comp carriers, what they do is they do credits or debits based on a number of different things, based on your safety program, right? Um, and then, you know, based on... Uh, you know, maybe a down payment or whatever, all these other factors come in, they do debits and credits. And then the other thing that they do, guaranteed, is they look at your mod rate and they say, what is your mod rate? So if your mod rate is a 0.2, they add 20% on top of that. If it's a 0.8, they, they add it to your debits. So imagine, right, how much your mod rate affects your premium. We uh, we looked at a, at a prospect not too long ago. Their moderate is like 252. That's huge. So again, just 50, just if you, even if you had a moderate of 1.5, you have to add 50 percent on top of that premium. I used the example earlier. Okay, um, you know for that for that for that bike messenger company, right? Their premium went up sixty thousand dollars a month because their mod rate shot up. So I cannot emphasize how important controlling your mod rate is, right? Uh, mod rate is calculated using a number of different variables. The biggest variable, just so you know, is payroll, right? So the more payroll you have, of course, through calculations, right? Um, you know, your, your mod rate won't jump as much, but if you have a small payroll, one injury, can significantly escalate your mod rate. And then just, just to, uh, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, if you go back to the previous slide to kind of summarize everything, class codes, they're either risky or they're not. That's, that's what you're essentially what you were trying to say. And then in regards to um, this slide in particular, um, I'm blanking on everything I was going to say. Um, never mind. <laughs> but um, what I was going to say was essentially the class codes are risky, some are not, and payroll is, like you said, a big factor. Never mind. I'm, I'm having a blank right now. My apologies. Well, I, th I, th I think also what you're going to point out was look at the difference there $300,000, right? Now I remember what I was going to say. Your X1 can never be one. Um, it can never go to zero. Your class codes essentially determine, um, and your payroll determine how low your X1 could go as well. That was the other main point. And by the way, if you don't know what your X1 is, find out. 
talk to us, right? Contact your risk management team. Let's make sure, you know, by the way, with us, as we do your renewals for you every year, this is something that is a huge factor in terms of uh, what we look at. And, and, I, and I'll say this, one of the things about BDSI I, I, is that this is unique to us only. And probably we're, all, we're one of the only PEOs that probably do this. But we also understand that you as a business owner, you as an operation manager are not reflective of this s -mod. Just because you might have a 1.5, or 1.6 doesn't mean that you have a bad safety program. Doesn't mean that you, as an operation manager, are doing a poor job of safety. This is not a reflection of you. This could be a reflection also of, I'm sorry to say this, but being unlucky, right? This could be a reflection of you having, maybe unfortunately having some bad seeds. I was looking at a prospect once their X model was like a 1.85. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm doing the underwriting for them, and I'm wondering, my gosh, what happened? You're, you're a, um, there's a trucking company. And like, why is it 1.85? You know, and I looked at, they only had 10 claims, right? And out of the 10 claims, five of them came from one person, right? There's not an event where out of the 10 claims, it was like two. So you have repeaters. You have people that are uh, the ones to litigate. You have, you have people that are, you know, working the system, unfortunately, right? Uh, one of his employees skipped town. They went to the doctor and then they skipped town. And, you know, for six, seven months, right, they were on their loss runs, they were on the workers' comp, the claim was open, and it was an indemnity, it was lost time. So they had no idea, you know, what was going on. This is why it's so important to work with us to do these loss run reviews with you, to do these um, meetings where we where we're looking at your losses. You want to look at your losses at least quarterly. Right, we want to do a, a, a risk review um, and a loss analysis review at least quarterly with the risk manager. You want to look at your moderate. So the great thing about BBSI, to be honest with you, is that whenever we do renewals and things like that, yes, we see this number, but we have a little bit more flexibility. Just so you know, we have a little bit more flexibility in terms of saying, oh my gosh, we have to add 20%. It says 1.2, we have to add 20%. It says 1.5, we have to add 50%. Because of our uniqueness in terms of our program, our workers' comp program, we have a little bit more flexibility, and we do that a lot. Okay. And uh, one last thing to say is uh, another factor with these injuries is it's on a three-year window. Um, so basically, your X-Mod is based off of three year, your last three policy periods. So if you have an injury, um, it, think of it as a running report card. And so you, you want to try to keep that re report card as clean as possible. Yeah, exactly. Three years. So one thing I wanted to say, if, if, if I could, um, that I've noticed, and it's not a BBSI problem, it's one of your um, people that does work for you is Cor Corbell is very slow at fixing the problems that they see. And that, I think, affects a lot of our um, X mods because they let stuff go on or don't properly get a hold of people and it escalates the problem and hopefully you and Bob and those guys are fixing that because that's a, a huge problem, I think, industry wide. Yeah, I'm sorry, who, who's and again, because I can't, I, I've got my screen. Who, who was that? That was me, Willard. Will, hey, Willard. No, Willard, first of all, thank you for the input. I appreciate that. Um, and, and that is obviously some things that we, you know, because again, Corbell is our third party administrator, right? So we want to make sure that, of course, they're servicing your employees, number one, first and foremost, and then of course the client. So if you, if you do see, see those situations where there's not communication between the adjuster and the employee, or we, we feel like, you know what, there's hiccups uh, in the claim progression towards closure, let us know and we can always communicate with the adjuster and figure out what's going on. Um, unfortunately, there, as you know, Willard, there are some things that because they might be litigated or what have you, uh, sometimes they, they they delay the claim, whether it's because they're, they're waiting for a PQME or an AME uh, or a third-party medical evaluation, whatever, things that sometimes generally get in the way for claim progression um, because, it's, again, whether it's litigated or it's involved with workers' comp appeals board. But again, at the very least, right, we want to make sure that there is communication to you or the employee as to what's happening. And if that's not happening, please reach out to your 
your risk manager, your HRC, um, to address that. And we will absolutely do that and communicate well, with the hotel. By the comments, and I don't mean to, to butt in, but I can see by the comments, it's not just our company that sees that, and it's not directly a reflection on BBSI, but it is your company, Corvell, that is doing that. And um, my admin, uh, Ninette, has made many, many, many attempts to figure things out with Corvell and Janice for incidents, and that. I feel is probably your biggest Achilles tendon. Um, they do not respond well. And that causes people to want to proceed to litigation. Um, I believe you were actually in the meeting with Bob and Chris and Janice about this and the fact that they're not getting back to our employee timely, not giving them their appointments, denying their appointments. And then that's when you see a really big problem. And eventually what happens is it drags it out, we lose more lost days, and our experience mod gets, um, reflects that that problem. And I think if there's a way you guys could fix it, that would help all of your clients out, including us, um, a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I just saw, as you were talking, I saw the chats as well. So absolutely, no, you're right. And, and look, anything, and, and we are definitely working with Corvell to make sure that there is communication. And, and in, in those situations, what I would recommend, like we talked about, is reach out to us, okay? The RMC, the HRC, or Bob, you know, in your case, or anybody else to say, look, the employee is not having, is having a problem connecting or getting information, or whatever it is they need from the adjuster, right? And we will make sure that we work our darndest to ensure that that is addressed. Okay. okay. Thanks for letting me comment. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Willie. And I realize, Willie, just who you were as, as you were talking. That's all right. Yeah, thanks, bro. No, and again, reach out to us. And I know that some of you are, are doing a better job with that as well as reaching out directly to the business and saying, look, my employee is not able to connect with the adjuster or there's a problem or my employee is waiting for a referral, for example, right? Uh, for an ortho kind of consult or hand consult, whatever it is, and that's not happening. So reach out to us and we will make sure that we do whatever we have to do to, uh, to help the employee, okay? So here, Austin talked about it. This is basically showing you, right, that your XMOD is, is basically experienced three years, but not, but excluding the current pause period. So they look at three years, excluding your current pause period, and then that's how they calculate your XMOD. Right, another slide, right, that kind of shows you in, in essence what we talked about. So if your X minus is 0.5, modified premium, right, it adds $50,000, if it's 0.75, that's 75,000 and so on. Okay. Somebody mentioned this, Chris, I think it was you or Austin, but let's not forget OSHA, right? And we talked about already the, the high hazard program, right, where they send you a letter. But right now, our risk team is very involved. A lot of the reasons why we get clients sometimes is because they get in these OSHA jams. And we assist them with the appeal. We actually assist them in the, in the resolution or having them get out of these violations. Uh, that's how we, we do get a lot of our, our clients is because they need the safety support. But OSHA costs money, folks. Right? So this shows you okay, that a typical citation can cost $13,000 per violation. Okay? And it can even be per day if you didn't mitigate it. Um, if you have repeaters, okay, the maximum penalty in 2021 for such violations was $136,532. Do you want to pay $136,000 for an OSHA fine or for that matter $10,000 or for that matter $5,000? No, right? And again, I would guarantee you if you have a serious accident where an employee had to go to the hospital for more than 24 hours, or there's an amputation, right, or God forbid, or death. Or dismemberment, disfigurement, those are considered serious accidents. OSHA will be at your door. Right? By the way, in those situations, you need to notify the risk managers ASAP. You have to contact Cal OSHA within eight hours because it's a $5,000 fine if you don't contact them within eight hours for serious accidents. But then what they do is they go in there and then they basically do a wall to wall inspection. They look at your programs. They want to make sure you have your IIPD, your heat prevention program, your lockout tiger program. I can go on and on and on. 
They want to make sure that training is being done monthly basis, quarterly, right? They want to make sure that all these health and safety management systems that we talked about are in place. If they're not in place, they're going to find you. So again, another way where accidents cost money. All right. So what do we do about it? All right. We'll spend here the next, I'm going to kind of breeze through some of these slides here. Uh, does anybody have, you know, questions on the, the monetization, right? I think by now we, we understand, look, there's, there's dollars and cents associated with accidents. And I, I'm hoping that I've illustrated to you in what parameters they're related and how they're related, right? Moderate. Indirect cost, direct cost, profitability, revenue, right? Workers' comp costs, premiums in itself, right? You don't want to go from $20,000 a month in premium to $60,000. Now, that's a, that's a big company. We'll talk about that. But even if you went from whatever it was, you know, $5,000 to $10,000 or $1,000 to $5,000 in workers' comp premium on a monthly basis, why do you want to do that? Right? So it costs money. So I'm hoping we illustrated. And we, we tied in the monetization directly to how much injuries cost you. Okay, so a couple of things we can do. Number one is really have a good injury management program in place. How you report injuries, how you manage your workers' comp claims. And this is what this slide illustrates. And, you know, you, you want to make sure that, as, as illustrated here, you have a very solid injury and illness reporting procedure in place. Now for you all, that means a BBSI procedure. So again, if you haven't gone through an injury management training yet, please do so. We wanna do this with every client twice a year. And it's very, very specific in terms of how we teach you, right? To not only report injuries and to manage them going forward. You know, to the point where we are talking to you about what to do. And I know if Annabelle is on this call, she does an excellent job with this. Just she's, she's so impressive in terms of you know, what, uh, how she's communicating with her employees and making sure that every time they go to the doctor, they check in with her when they get there, they call her afterwards, they send her a work status report, you know, the actual work status report, uh, uh, text it, text to her, and then it shows what their work status is, whether it's a mod duty, whether it's full duty, or whether it's discharge, and then the very next day, you know, Annabelle's talking to them with the supervisor, talking about, hey, let's now review when they, when they, you know what, let's now review the work status report, and let's make sure that, you know, your mod duty, okay, your mod duty is lifting, you know, no lifting more than 20 pounds, okay, and you have an agreement. That's why in our forms, we also have a mod duty agreement saying, okay, I, as an employer, I'm not going to put you in a position where you're, you're going to exceed your mod duty, and, and you, as an employee, are not going to put yourself in a position where you're going to exceed these mod duties, right? So then as we do this kind of close the process of the medical management piece of ensuring that you know every time and everything that's happening with the employees, Chris, Austin, Joe and I, we should never ever have a situation where we call you and say, hey, what's the status of this employee? What's the status of this claim? Because what you should have is a nice, in our, in our BBSI process, a nice red folder, got that hand in there, so you know, uh, a nice red folder that, that shows, hey, Rob Singh, date of injury, 4 7 22, sprained ankle. And it should have all my paperwork in there, my DWC 1 form signed, the supervisor investigation form, right? The employee form. And then subsequently, every single work status report after they visit a the doctor. Now, you guys, you guys should be having care contacts with these individuals once a week. Hey, Rob, how's that ankle doing? Um, are we still staying within our restrictions? Is that okay? Talking to the supervisor, how's that person doing? And making sure that I do that, that weekly care contact, that'll also eliminate the cost of the claim because if you're showing the love, you're having that weekly care contact with the employee, they're less likely to even litigate too because now you know the employee, the employee feels like, hey, you know what? I've got a relationship with my employer. I've got somebody in my corner. And if the adjuster from Corbell, all right, 
is delaying my phone call or my, re, my, my, my return call or haven't heard anything in, in terms of my referral for physical therapy, at that point, you can reach out to us and say, hey, you know what, my employee, I was doing my weekly, my weekly care contact with my employee, and they told me that they still haven't heard back in terms of referral for physical therapy. Or, you know, they, they left two or three messages with Corbell or the adjuster, and they, they, have, they don't have a call back. So having a very solid injury management protocol and procedure is really important. Reporting injuries, that's why we have that red folder that FNL will send you. And again, by the way, if you don't have the latest red folder or what we call final notice of loss, the injury paperwork, the BUSI reporting procedures, please reach out to one of us and we can email it to you. There should never be a situation where where you're like, what do I do about an injury? How do I report it? The oh, there's a question in the chat. Susan asked, would you have a separate binder annually? Um, Susan, in what respect? You mean a safety binder or a separate injury folder? Reporting that. binder, because we've been around since 1991 and ours is very full. <laughs> but I'm thinking if you just have one annually, then uh, there's no confusion about what happened during that uh, year. Yeah, no, Susan, do me a favor, reach out to your risk manager or HRC. Um, and we'll get you a revised form, okay? Um, the, the, the forms are, and again, electronic, PDF, billable, all those things. Okay. So this is a huge part of keeping the cost of a claim low, making sure that you have an injury reporting procedure communicated to your employees. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, I, I did a Six Sigma study on workers' comp, and we looked at what the two major costs, what the two major factors were in terms of increased workers' comp costs. And what we did, a Six Sigma study we did, was called failure mode effects analysis. And what it came out to was there's two things. One was lag time in terms of reporting. So employees need to report injuries, right, within 24 hours. 24, 40 hours. We need to make sure that we get these the injury reporting forms or red folder to us to be decided within 24 hours. So lag time was one of them. And then the second thing was referrals. So once the employee got away from the treating, the, the primary treating physician, the PTP, from consent or whatever, and they went to a specialist like a like an orthopedic, or whatever. Look, the orthopedic doesn't have that much of a vested interest. Right, because you know uh, they're they're not part of really the MPN. You know they're not being monitored or supervised by by the insurance companies. So that also was a big factor because the the, the referrals those those referral doctors didn't really do a good job and they just kind of just let the claim kind of linger on and on and on. But this is really really critical. Your injury management procedures are critical, and that's why again I recommend it. If you haven't gone through injury management training with us, we do it twice a year with every client. Please make sure you reach out to your risk manager. And let's get that scheduled ASAP. Okay. It's 1059. I'm not going to go through so much of the rest of these, but here's other things, okay, in terms of having, you know, really a best in class health and safety management system. So you want to have a safety committee, right? We want to do training. We want to have all of our core programs in place, you know, whether it's your your PPE program, um, ensuring that you know we are looking to PPE once a year. We're doing annual certification for PPE. That's actually by law we have to do that. Uh, you know, making sure that we uh, are doing site inspections. We're doing training. Okay, um, these are all examples of solid health and safety management systems. Ensuring you, you know you might even have a, an incentive program. Okay where you can't necessarily do where, where you say, hey, you know what, if I went six months without a lost time injury, right, we're gonna give everybody a barbecue, or we're gonna give, uh, now what you have to do, but you know, it, it's kind of the way that the OSHA has it now, where you have to look at leading income and saying, hey, we went six months and everybody attended six months worth of safety trainings. We had, if you're a construction company, you have to do weekly tailgates once a week, right? So, hey, you know what, in six months, we had, we never missed a weekly tailgate and everybody attended, that might be a reason to have a barbecue. That might be a reason to get a taco truck, right? That might be a reason to, you know, maybe even, you know what, give everybody a movie ticket. Okay, so incentive programs. Okay, but these are all things that we as a risk management team 
help you install. Again, a best in class health and safety management system. It's going to cause that involves safety trainings, inspections, programs. Okay. Having an IPP, right? Making sure your IPP is being followed absolutely to a T. And having code of safe work practices in place. I talk about inspections, right? Having a behavior based program in place. We do that a lot now. Behavior based is so, so critical, where you're doing job safety walks once a week and not looking at anything operational, but you're simply walking up to the floor and saying, hey, Susan, great job. Thank you so much for wearing some safety glass. I appreciate that. And by the way, great, great wine bottle, you know? Um, and and by, you, you kept that, you kept the cork on the wine bottle so it wouldn't spill and cause a stick and fall. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. By doing that, you kept the stick and fall from happening. All of a sudden, I'm like, Susan's like looking at me like, wow. These are common, you know, I'll say that's a behavior based observation you can make, right? But I'm not focused on what you did bad. I'm focused on what you did good. We actually help you with that. So if you're interested in installing, this behavior-based observation program, let us know. We actually install it for you. And we help you implement it. Okay, and we talk about the safety uh, set program, the barbecues and things you can do. But again, base it on leading indicators, not lag indicators. Because if OSHA ever came and said, hey, why do you have this center program? Say, well, it's because we're doing great in safety. It's not, you, you don't say, well, we went 180 days without, a, without an injury. Because it becomes kind of a punitive and it also, can lead to non-reporting injuries, okay? All right. Okay. Chris, Austin, anything to add? Um, I think you covered pretty much everything in terms of monetizing it. It's important that we do implement these safety programs. So again, avoid OSHA to avoid, um, to effectively have a reduction in insurance costs, X mods. Um, I think you did a great job in terms of covering everything that needed to be touched based on. That was awesome. Yeah, I think you, you pretty much highlighted, highlighted everything. Have we, Chris, have we answered all the chat questions? Yeah, yeah. For, um, I think Curtis had a, had a question on uh, scheduling on-site safety training. Um, Curtis, I, I'll reach out to you after this training and then we can coordinate something actually. And um, again, the main the main purpose is right is to avoid injuries, and that's the purpose of why we want to implement these safety programs so we can avoid this whole conversation as it, all together. Because if you don't have injuries, there's no need to monetize anything of why an injury happens. So the whole thing is about prevention um, and getting in front of it. Yeah. And and yeah, and Austin, that's absolutely right. Right, prevention. We won't have to monetize anything. I love how Austin said it. You don't have to monetize anything. If you have no injuries, right, you have to pay extra workers comp premiums. And again, that's why I say utilize us, folks. Right, we should be meeting with you at least on a minimum quarterly basis, at the very least, to help you with your safety programs. We do trainings for you. We have we lead the safety committee. We develop the safety committee for you. We develop all your programs for you. Any program you need, we develop all that for you. Think of us as almost like a remote safety coordinator for you, right? An extension of your team. So please take advantage of us. I have a quick question. Yeah. This is our safety guy. Um, when are we due for you to look at our PPE again? Who is that, Willie? Yes. You can do it anytime, Willie. Have, uh, reach out to uh, Chris and I. We'll schedule a meeting here, uh, in fact, this week or next week if you want to. Um, can you uh, give me a list of what um, ours was from last year so I can compare it with what we already have? This year, and then uh, yeah, sometime next week I'll find out when Annette's going to be back since she coordinates that, and then um, give you a couple days where maybe we could set it up. Yeah, and that would involve what we call PP assessment. We have a form for that. We sit down. We say, okay, what are the hazards for each particular job you're doing, and then from there, what is the PP we need? And we 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 all agree that that's what we want. We sign it. And remember, keep in mind, folks, you have to pay for that PP. That's that's just make sure. Especially yeah, we, we do that already. I just wanted to see if you had what we had um, for our job classifications from last year and previous, so we could compare it and and go off of that. And you yeah. know, obviously Definitely. things change. So I'd like to make sure that we're compliant. Okay. And Cecilia, 
Yes, yeah, same thing. Uh, who is your business unit, your, your business partner, whether it's Gary, Bob, Brian, Sharif? Brian. Brian is. Okay. And Cecilia, what company do you work for? Everything Goes Relocation Services. Everything Goes Relocation? Okay. Chris, let's make a mental note of that. Um, everything goes. So we'll reach out to Joe. Yeah, okay. Joe's going to be your point of Joe, contact. Yeah, Joe Laura will be your risk manager. Okay. And uh, Curtis, just to answer your question, um, Chris would be your uh, risk manager since Sharif is your uh, business partner. I hope. But, okay, folks, hopefully this will help. We have a recording of this that we'll send out. And by the way, if you need, uh, and I think I saw a, a message there as well saying, you know, how do you get any other recordings, whether it's injury management training, just email again, whether it's, it's myself, uh, your risk manager. Um, like what I'm going to do real quick here is on the chat. Guys, if you can do the same thing, rob.singh at bbsi.com. That is my email, my phone number. Okay. And then, fellas, if you can do the same thing, just so everybody has it real quick. And reach out to any of us if you need anything, whether it's a recording or a, a Can prior I get recording. A copy of the slides too, please. Yeah, absolutely. Email us for the slides as well. Okay. Hey guys, I got to jump off, but um, it was nice meeting everybody. Um, if you do want to, um, like you said, like what we're upside schedule, um, time, just reach out to your risk professional, and um, hopefully I'll be out with maybe Rob or and or Chris or Joseph on some of the visits with you guys. So take it easy. Awesome. Okay, bye now. Right, folks. Yep. And so there's uh, Rob, there's mine and Chris's email. If you want to take a screenshot, or if you want to use about ten seconds or so to write that down. Email us for anything you need or questions. And we'll make sure that actually Janice, what we'll do, what Janice will do is send everybody that was registered on this a copy of the presentation as well as copy of the recording. You'll get that automatically, by the way. And if you need a recording in that same email that Janice sends you from HR, if you need another recording or another presentation, let her know. Okay. All right, folks, have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. We appreciate your partnership you have with us we want to continue to serve you to the best you know to the highest level actually and uh if we can do anything for you please let us know otherwise have a great weekend coming up take care thanks everyone thanks